Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to Inside the Issue. As a day we talk about the integration of targeted therapy and immunotherapy in the management of localized non-small cell lung cancer. We have a great faculty today, Dr. Jamie Chaft from the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, and Dr. John Haymock from the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. We also recruited several other investigators to take a survey of their usual treatment practices, and we'll show you a number of uh, slides along the way from that survey during this webinar. As always, if you have any questions or cases you'd like to run by us, just type them into the chat room. We'll talk about as many of these as we have time. We're putting out a one-minute pre- and post-meeting survey in the chat room. We'd really appreciate it if you could take it. It'll help us learn a little bit more about you. Uh, we're doing a program on uh, September 26th next week on mantle cell lymphoma. should be really interesting. Got a lot of new things to talk about there. Uh, then on Thursday, uh, September 28th, uh, we'll be working with Dr. Enziger uh, on our new series on uh, gastroesophageal cancer we're starting. And then on October the 3rd, we'll deal with a topic we don't talk about too much, non-melanoma skin cancer, but a lot going on, particularly as it relates to checkpoint inhibitors. So the first two Saturdays of uh, October are going to be a lot of fun for us. Uh, we're doing two uh, day-long meetings, first in Orlando of, with the Florida Cancer Specialist. Uh, if you're in the Orlando area, you want to drop in. But for the rest of you, if you want to check it out online, we have a number of uh, oncologists covering a number of tumors. And then the following Saturday, we'll be out in Las Vegas uh, with the American Oncology Network for the second part of this. We'll cover a bunch of other tumors that you can either drop in and uh, join us in Vegas or check it out online. We know a lot of people end up listening to our webinars when they're driving or working out or raking the leaves. If you're into audio programs, check out our Oncology Today series, including a recent program with Dr. Gubins on what happened at ASCO. But today we're about to tackle a really interesting subject with a lot of new information as we do with many of these webinars, I met with the faculty separately to record a presentation. Uh, they're both posted in the chat room, and when we send out an email uh, with this webinar, we'll also include that. So really, ideally, it would be to watch both these presentations and then uh, check out the webinar where we sort of try to take things to the next level in terms of clinical application and new research. Here are the papers that are covered in these presentations, and we also a number of cases are presented by the faculty. Uh, you really can get a lot. These are great presentations. I really recommend that you check them out. But we pulled a number of slides uh, from these presentations uh, that we're going to include here tonight and also some of the findings for the survey. Here's where we're heading. Basically, uh, we're going to start out talking about uh, adjuvant, neoadjuvant targeted therapy, and then we'll get into immunotherapy. But before we start going through the data and all the decisions, just uh, some thoughts about uh, uh, patient involvement in these decisions. And I'm curious, faculty, what your thoughts are about it. I want to share with the audience uh, a pre presentation we did actually in 2007. This is a project uh, we did in colon cancer that mimicked a, a classic study uh, that was done in breast cancer. Uh, and uh, this is the breast cancer study. It was done in Australia in the 80, 1980s when adjuvant chemotherapy was coming out. And they asked these patients who'd had chemotherapy, what would it take for you to go through chemotherapy again? How much benefit in uh, survival? And the thing that caught a lot of attention was that there were patients, not a small number, who were willing to go through chemotherapy for as little as a 1% improvement in survival. A lot of people thought, well, maybe women are more proactive about their health. You know, they're kind of a striking findings. So we, just tried to, we decided to try to do the same thing in colon cancer. We created six scenarios. We found, I think, 100 patients who got an adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, we presented scenarios where anywhere they were going to have an absolute benefit, which is really the key number in the adjuvant situation, anywhere from 1 to 10%. We did an audio program to teach them about this. We used these graphics with little stick figures to explain what it means if you're, five, you're one of the five out of 100 uh, and how the therapy affects it. And this is what we saw, something very similar to what was seen in breast cancer. Quite a few patients, about a third, this is just risk for recurrence, 
a third willing to go through chemotherapy for a 1% improvement. But then if you look over on the right, 12% of patients were not willing to get chemo, even if they had an absolute benefit of 10%. And this is something I really was curious about, whether there's a difference in men and women. And you can see uh, there's no difference in terms of at least this type of variable. We also asked 150 general medical oncologists in the, an accompanying survey to predict what they thought these patients were going to say, and they generally underestimated uh, what we, uh, what the patient's interest in therapy was. This actually ended up getting in the prominent medical journal USA Today. I'm just kidding about that, but it was an interesting uh, study. Jamie, I know this is an interest of yours uh, in particular. I think you were telling me you just did a grand rounds on this topic. Uh, patient involvement, particularly in the adjuvant and neoadjuvant setting, where really the benefit is a number. And my question is for patients who want it. I mean, we've had patients presented who were, the patients were medical oncologists who could understand this. For patients who want it, will you attempt to give them some kind of a number uh, in terms of what to expect and clarify for them what the absolute benefit is? And in general, what your thoughts are about patient involvement, Jamie? Yeah, I, I'm actually much more um, willing and probably precise in attempting to give a, a number to estimate benefit in the perioperative, in the pre or postoperative setting, than I am for patients who ask for numbers with advanced disease. I think we're, we're far less able to predict an advanced disease. Uh, in the early stage, unfortunately, our data sets are small relative to breast cancer and colorectal cancer. And the patients included in many of these trials are extremely heterogeneous. So you do your best to, mes to estimate risk or benefit relative to the characteristics of that patient based on the subset analyses of these studies. But I absolutely do my best to give them an estimated absolute survival or event-free survival number. And you know, we're not talking about forcing this on patients. We're just offering it if they want to hear it. If they don't want to hear it, they don't need to. John, what's your take on this? And also, what do you see in terms, and this is a very global issue about patients who are very, very aggressive. They're not very oriented around toxicity. They want every benefit. We're about to talk about a case of a, a patient who had five kids, et cetera. And the other end of the spectrum, and people often think about older patients with comorbidities, people want to do anything they can to avoid toxicity. What do you see in lung cancer, John? You know, you think about older people with, you know, comorbid disease, but what's the spectrum of attitudes that you see? Yeah, you know, it, 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 the conversation with patient is really important because, as you highlighted, there are people on either end of the spectrum and you wouldn't necessarily be able to predict them ahead of time. You know, you you might say, well, younger people want to be more aggressive. But very often, you know, I've had people in their 70s who have an absolutely wonderful quality of life and they want to, you know, they want to do everything, even if it's a couple percent benefit. Uh, a couple of things I'll note about it. The, um, the, the This is actually very often the longest conversation I have with patients because you're explaining sort of both absolute benefit and relative benefit. One thing that I often notice is people sometimes overestimate the detriment from chemotherapy. You know, sometimes people are told even by general physicians, uh, general practice physicians, oh, the treatment is as bad as the disease. And one of the things I have to tell them is, actually, that's not the case. The mortality from platinum doublet chemotherapy for four cycles is less than 0.3%. You know, so the, everybody gets through the chemotherapy, essentially. And very often people find out when they get through it, they're like, oh, that wasn't as bad as I expected because it may have been that they heard about chemo from breast cancer or leukemia or some other setting. So, so it's a long conversation, but people can be really thoughtful. And I think it's important to understand where they are in that spectrum to make these decisions. And also, you know, I think if a patient wants a number, I mean, you don't have to give an exact number if you don't think, if you want to give a range, you know, but I just was curious what the response was. Jamie, you know, we were talking before, I think a lot of oncologists have been in practice for a while, uh, know about the adjuvant online model that uh, Dr. Peter Rabden put out, no longer there, uh, where you could plug in the, you know, cancer characteristics, the type of adjuvant therapy, and get an absolute benefit that you could tell patients, and docs use that a lot. But one of the things that was really interesting is it factored in the patient's age and, com and the issue of comorbidities and non-cancer cause of death. And that really affects the absolute benefit a lot 
if you have an 85, 90 year old person who has a five year mortality from other diseases of, you know, 30%, that's going to affect the benefit that you can get. Any interest in Jamie, a, an adjuvant online type thing that can factor in age, factor these things in, in uh, lung cancer? Do you think that anything like that would be a benefit? It'd be a huge benefit with, with all of the evolving data. I think the, the tough part about designing it is you'd really need AI technology to incorporate all of the recent clinical trial data and pull that in. And then some sort of uh, sophisticated medical modeling that would translate exactly what you're talking about. Because if you think about these clinical trial patient populations, they're probably 10 to 20 years younger than the patients we see in the clinic on average. So it's almost impossible to estimate what the act, the risk benefit ratio is in that 85 year old in the clinic when most of the patients enrolled on these clinical studies are 60 to 65. I think also, and here are some um, questions we asked in the survey about what numbers um, in general you're given to people. So for example, here's a situation of a patient uh, TPS of 50, but who's got an exon 19 deletion is going to get osimertinib with or without chemo. And we have four scenarios here, but I just, all I want you to focus on is the, the variability and, and the homogeneity of the answers. I think you, you can see that there, there is a lot of variation, but on the other hand, there's kind of a, a circle that you can sort of make around. You start adding in absolute benefits. And, you know, we've done projects where we had 25 investigators, you know, evaluate 100 scenarios. I mean, you can do this and really start to come up with some numbers that might be useful to patients. Well, anyhow, I just want to sort of bring that point out before we get started in terms of the context of the data we're about to talk about. So let's talk about uh, neoadjuvant adjuvant therapy. And, John, I can't. this case really uh, was, um, that you presented really struck me. A lot. I'm just going to get Jamie's uh, initial response to this. This is a kind of a scenario I've been presenting on webinars ever since Adora came out, and I'm going to share with you how people respond to it. But first, I want to ask Jamie if today, now this is a two years ago, but if today a 51 year old uh, non smoking mother of five exercises all the time, uh, uh, physicians in the family very uh, interested in what's going on non-smoker presents with a stage two, T2, N1M0, PD-1 less than 1%, and she's found to have a red fusion, and walks in and said, how about giving me uh, a RET inhibitor, which is what she said to John. We'll hear what happened when with John, but I'm curious about your thoughts, Jamie. I'm sure patients do come in like this. Uh, in this kind of situation, if they were saying to you today, how about giving me a RET inhibitor, what would you say? I'd probably take a step back and present to them first the data on chemotherapy. And I, I would probably advocate very, fairly strongly here for chemotherapy, which is the one therapy in this disease scenario that has been shown to improve survival, particularly for node positive disease. But I would entertain a, a RET inhibitor. It's off label. The side effects are not a walk in the park, but I don't think it's unreasonable to consider given given the Adora data and the Alina press release. Yeah, it's really going to be interesting. Just that press release alone, I'm seeing people rethinking things. So we'll see. It now is different than two years ago. But what happened here, and I, again, I can't thank John enough for sharing this because it's a challenge. <laughs> what a case. Amazing. So in any event, John said just what you said. And I, uh, John said begrudgingly she agreed to assist <laughs> PEM got through it and it wasn't too terrible and then said, well, John, uh, Dr. Haymock, how about doing some CT DNA monitoring on me? That was maybe another idea she got from her family. And so John said, yes. And lo and behold, at a year, the DNA is positive. She's got a liver met. Nothing else gets resected. She's now on a RET inhibitor and doing well. So, uh, uh, John, any thoughts about what this was like for you? I know you, as I think you, in a very kind way, she said she was, quote, a little peeved that you yep. wouldn't give her the, uh, uh, and I'm curious whether you would re be, approach a case like this differently now, John, but can you just yeah. tell us what it was like to go through, go through this with her? Yeah, well, I, th I think you nailed, nailed it, that this is, this is the type case that makes me sort of rethink uh, the approach and, and, you know, everything I told her beforehand was, was 
true that we have data for chemo. We don't have data for selpercatinib. But she pointed out absolutely correctly that it's reasonable to extrapolate. She knew the Adora data. You know, her husband is a, uh, a physician. She's very sophisticated. And, um, and I said, well, uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. I'm sure if we did the Adora study uh, equivalent with selpercatinib, there's no doubt it would be positive. But we haven't done it. We don't know if insurance is going to cover it. Um, so I think it was a little bit of a case of sort of the purist who says we're only going to do what the data already tells us we can do versus what's your best guess based on the, the other data that's out there. And I tend to be on the aggressive side. I tend to be somebody that will extrapolate more. In this particular case, I sort of stuck with the data and, uh, and, and I was wrong. Um, you know, I, I think that, uh, I, you know, I think she was absolutely right, uh, here. Uh, that uh, the benefit would have been greater from uh, selpercatinib. And, and in fact, you know, now that we've got the Alina data, we don't have it yet, we have the press release. You know, I wonder, once you've got two cases of adjuvant, you know, I wonder if people are going to start extrapolating more. Um, you know, so I, I can tell you that when I, I discussed this liver met with her, you know, she, you know, I, I wouldn't say she... Um, blamed me but but you know boy if those were laser beams coming out of her eyes i would have been pretty <laughs> fried up there uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you and and you know you, you know in the same way i remember um some cases where i i knew my mother was dying to say i told you so i know she was dying to say i told you so um but we we aggressively resected the liver met uh and she's been doing great on selpercatinib since that time um you know but um you know I think ultimately we all sense, I, I imagine, that a TKI would, would add benefit. We, it's just hard to complete these studies with all these little subgroups. John, did you and give the sulc- me, not- sulpercatinib before you resected the liver met just to confirm the tumor was sensitive? No, we, we biopsied it first, um, but we had, we, had, um, we already had the ctDNA that right around that time that started coming up in a hurry that we knew the right fusion was still there. So, um, and she was right about that. She wanted it sent to Natera. I had told her, I don't know what we would do with the data. And of course, it was the next, um, it was the next time that we saw the CTDNA rising uh, uh, there. So it was, um, it was a, a great case of me uh, eating humble pie because everything she said was the better thing than what I recommended. Yeah, and, and Jatendra in the chat, chat room is asking him, did she clear her CDNA, which she, she did. did. I guess she after cleared the it surgery, immediately. And, she, and she's still and she's still negative. I, yep. I'm not trying to say people should use should do this at all. I'm just trying to right. create a conversation and particularly yep. to allow the patient to at least know about what's going on. Yep. That's that's my only hope. I think yep. also, John, not only um, the uh, the ALK study that's going to be presented soon or the press release. The other thing was the survival data from Adora, which was just presented, which. I was stunned by, I mean, you all were maybe not as surprised, but I mean, very, uh, inter- you know, powerful, uh, you know, and there's insurance issues. These are expensive medications. So look, I don't know the right answer. I'm just trying to encourage conversation. I will say though, that when we, we did this like 10 times after a door was presented in webinars where we would ask faculty, okay, we, we incidentally, we always would ask about RET. The faculty would always say they wouldn't do it. And then I would poll the audience, which was general medical oncologists. Usually about half of them would say they would do it. I don't know who's right or wrong. I'm just pointing out a difference and different experiences, yep. too, because all this stuff with breast cancer, general oncologists have been through for years. It's almost like a Talmudic study. In any event, in this survey, we asked people, okay, uh, adjuvant setting, everybody, <laughs> of course, is using osimertinib. But this is what's interesting. You already have everybody saying they're going to use adjuvant ALK. I guarantee you that was not what people were saying, you know, a month ago before that press release. Right. They all expected it. But uh, uh, in any event, and as you can see, well, John well, is the I, only one who moved <laughs> over Rhett. And I think <laughs> you can understand why. <laughs> Anyhow, John, this uh, these are a couple of slides uh, from your talk, you know, getting into the patient strategy and, one thing that you got into, and actually I want to get Jamie's uh, thought about this, because uh, you went through this in your talk, Jamie. But one of the things is, of course, in general, whether we're talking about targeted therapy, but particularly with immunotherapy, 
is neoadjuvant versus adjuvant. And of course, this is something that has a long history in multiple tum tumors. From your perspective, Jamie, what do you see as uh, advantages and disadvantages of neoadjuvant treatment? Targeted therapy and immunotherapy and chemotherapy are each separate in their advantages. Targeted therapy, neoadjuvant, the only advantage is the dramatic tumor kill and the ability to render someone disease-free at the time of surgery with ease. I think it, in terms of uh, clinical benefit longitudinally, it's the duration of therapy that matters. Chemotherapy, the only advantage of preoperative therapy is that it's better tolerated. Immunotherapy is a different beast, and I think both preclinical models and the melanoma data sets show us that there's something real to having that tumor in situ and the lymph nodes, the draining lymph node basin left behind to allow the body to mount an anti-tumor response to the immunotherapy if that patient and the tumor are immunotherapy sensitive. So I think there are biological advan advantages to immunotherapy preoperatively, and they're just practical advantages for the TKI or chemotherapy. John, any thoughts on this? We had Georgina Long of, of melanoma fame, and she's been a big advocate and done a lot of the work on neoadjuvant melanoma. And there, it looks like you really get an advantage by starting therapy neoadjuvant for the reasons uh, Jamie mentioned. Any thoughts about what's going on there? Do you think that is for yep. real? And if, if you can, are you trying to do, is that your preference to generally do neoadjuvant therapy in this situation, particularly with, uh, in, uh, without targetable mutations? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yes to both. Uh, you know, there's even data in, in, from mouse models, and we've done this as well with the mouse models, where you give neoadjuvant or adjuvant, uh, and neoadjuvant uh, is better at preventing metastases. You mount a better immune response. There's different ways to, to measure that. So I, I do think that uh, neoadjuvant immunotherapy, if I had to choose one or the other, um, I would pick neoadjuvant, but I think ultimately, I, I think perioperative is going to be even better. You know, if we were like early stage breast cancer and curing 95% of patients, you you could quibble about, um, you know, which of those is better. But even with our most aggressive, you know, perioperative approach, the likelihood of recurring is still substantial. So I don't think this is a time for us to be, you know, backing off the gas here. You know, I think we, we really want to be pressing this advantage and figuring out how to build on it. So uh, this is a slide uh, from Jamie's uh, talk uh, looking at sort of the history of adjuvant, neoadjuvant therapy. We got, we got involved in the left end there when the, the adjuvant data came out with cisplatinum-based therapy. And you can see how much more has been happening in the last couple of years. You know, getting back to patient preference, uh, Jamie, I've always been kind of struck by, yes, there's a survival benefit looking back to 2003 and around that time when this first came out, but at least based on the data, the hazard rate's around 0.86. Of course, now you have to put, again, apply that depending upon what the, the risk is, but, you know, we're talking about cisplatinum-based chemotherapy, not the, uh, in the most pleasant experience. Yet I find uh, investigators very aggressive about wanting to offer and actually give chemotherapy in spite of, I mean, to me, kind of a minimal benefit. That was something else we saw with Adora when it first came out. General oncologists immediately went started talking about using it with, uh, without chemo, whereas the investigators, you know, we have the survival benefit, you know, et cetera. Any thoughts about that, Jamie? And again, to me, a little bit borderline benefit of chemotherapy. Yeah, I mean, in, with the TKI population, it's a different question. And the survival data perhaps will push people even further away from chemotherapy and towards TKI only. But that survival data is exceptionally immature, and the study was done in parts of the world where there's not universal access to, to drug at relapse. So I still think, if you think about the earlier studies of erlotinib or defitinib versus chemotherapy, they really weren't that different. And the chemotherapy probably still has a role here, particularly in curing, whereas we know the TKIs will prevent recurrence. Immunotherapy, so if you're thinking about a purely adjuvant population and you're, you're projecting to give just immunotherapy, not chemotherapy, we have to remember that our predictive biomarkers for immunotherapy sensitivity are just not very good. And that the vast majority of patients do not benefit from immunotherapy. So until we have better predictive biomarkers, I would argue that 
platinum-based chemotherapy remains a standard of care, whether it's neoadjuvant with IO or adjuvantly before IO until we have better data, uh, as long as the patient is fit enough to tolerate it. John, I'd like your thoughts on this. And also, um, we'll just go flip through a few of the uh, um, uh, slides related to Adora. This always struck my, uh, I thought this was really amazing, uh, the reduction in risk of CNS relapse, you know, a benefit in and of itself, regardless of, uh, of whether or not there's survival. Also, that it looked like you had the same hazard rate, rate uh, whether or not the patient got chemotherapy. Uh, these are the recent survival data Dr. Herbst just presented. Here's the ALENA study, and all we have right now is a press release uh, saying electinib uh, met its primary endpoint of uh, DFS. Uh, that just came out uh, September 1st. Of course, we haven't seen the data, but uh, I asked uh, the, uh, the people on the, I think this is what's driving everybody's interest to predict what, the, what it's going to show, and everybody's expecting to see sort of an Adora-like effect, so we'll see whether that happens or not. I think every, maybe, who knows, maybe it'll be even better. Uh, this is kind of your summary of where we are right now in terms of this uh, situation. Uh, but I want to also bring up the issue of neoadjuvant targeted therapy, Jamie. Uh, and obviously, this is done much less frequently. But you presented a case in your presentation of a patient who actually uh, got neoadjuvant osimertinib. Uh, can you just sort of briefly go through this? I know it was kind of a complicated case, but kind of the bottom line of what happened with this lady. Yeah, so it's a 60-year-old woman who presented with a very large symptomatic primary tumor, T3 in size. She had at least a single level, uh, level 2 lymph node at level 7 biopsy positive, but there were all, multiple other N2 nodes that were involved, including um, that anterior mediastinal node seen on that, the bottom PET panel. By FNA, she had an EGFR exon 19 deletion, and she was adamantly against chemotherapy. We did have the new Adora study open and offered to her, but the study required a core biopsy for EGFR mutation confirmation, which is just ridiculous FDA requirement. She refused chemotherapy, which would have been the standard of care. Um, also had very little interest in radiotherapy, and, and in some places, chemoradiotherapy perhaps would be the standard of care here. So she was treated with osimertinib with the first and foremost goal of shrinking her cancer and potentially rendering her disease resectable. And you can see here on this, the imaging a really impressive um, near complete response. So she went underwent surgery, initially an incomplete surgery outside and then returned to us and underwent a complete resection. Her T3 tumor was pathologically a T1A, my, a tiny minute focus of, of residual disease. And while the frozen section was positive, the permanent pathology section was not read as malignant. So she was ultimately uh, N0. So she, she was offered chemotherapy based on her initial stage and the fact that there was some viable disease left at the time of surgery and was accepting of chemotherapy but intolerant, received only a single cycle, and thereafter resumed osimertinib kind of a la Adora with the plan for at least three years of therapy, and she's partway through that now doing well. So, John, I'm curious about your thoughts about this case and also about the Neo-Adora study that's ongoing. It's such an interesting uh, study. We'll see uh, how that affects the approach. To I always thought it made a lot of sense. I think there was an intergroup study at one point that was trying to do this pre-chemo radiation use of targeted therapy. I think they couldn't accrue or something, but uh, it always made a lot of sense to me. John, do you ever use this strategy? Any thoughts about the case? Any thoughts I, about I, Neo Adora? Yeah, I, uh, so I, I think this is an excellent study. I think it's an important question. Um, I, I do it uh, and, and uh, from time to time, and, and I do it particularly if it's going to downstage the patient or, or make for a, a more straightforward surgery. Uh, particularly for bulky tumors, you know, so very often the response to a TKI is so good that something that is going to take a pneumonectomy or a bilobectomy, uh, you know, then converts to just a single lobectomy or, or uh, a segmental resection. Um, so I, I, I think that's one place where we would, would clearly do it. Uh, or if the patient is, you know, is, is symptomatic from the beginning, sometimes if we're worried about obstruction, uh, early on because you get such rapid shrinkage. So I think it makes a lot of sense. I agree with what Jamie said. I think um, 
you know, the key ultimately is going to be the duration of the therapy. Um, but if this uh, gets you more readily to, to uh, a successful surgery, I, th I think it's a, uh, it's a great thing. Um, you know, the, uh, the neodora, I, th I think, is is an important question. I don't think the benefits of giving it up front will be, as we see with immunotherapy here, uh, you know, quite as profound. You know, I think ultimately the duration will make a difference, um, but it may help improve uh, uh, the surgeries. Um, in the case of immunotherapy, we expect you mount a better immune response um, when the tumor is present, but it's hard to eliminate microscopic metastatic disease with immunotherapy alone. Here, um, we know that uh, the TKIs are very good for wiping out microscopic disease uh, from the Adora study. So so I think it's it's it, it would be great to add this to our armamentarium as another option uh, that we can use. So uh, picking out a couple of the questions and uh, you check it out. So we have so many other questions uh, in this survey that are really interesting, but just a couple more, and then we'll get to uh, immunotherapy. I found this really interesting, Jamie, that we said, how long do you use adjuvant osimertinib in a patient who's uh, receiving it? And a, m a number of people brought up the issue of going beyond three years, including you. Uh, can you comment a little bit on that, Jamie? I mean, even, even in the early data that has been presented from Adora, you do start to see a drop-off once patients stop the drug you start to see recurrence. And unfortunately, this study was not designed in a way where we're going to obtain meaningful recurrence data well after the time of discontinuation. But that, that's been our experience in the previous studies and off-label use of earlier generation TKIs. It's what we saw in all of the first generation TKI adjuvant studies. So we really think that duration and continuing to suppress micrometastatic disease is a way to keep these patients from having symptomatic recurrence. So a couple more quick questions. John, I've always been curious about the issue of adherence. People always assume that uh, cancer patients are going to take oral medications. We know like adjuvant tamoxifen, for example, that doesn't necessarily happen. We asked uh, this group, do you think adherence is an issue with adjuvant and everybody says, somewhat. What's your experience with that, John? And do you sort of ask, you know, keep a track of whether people are taking their meds? Yeah, I, well, I, somewhat is a big improvement from what we had before. If you go back and look at the old Jafitnib adjuvant studies, the Setong study or the um, uh, the Radiant study was another one with their Lotnib. Uh, the compliance was pretty poor for those studies, you know, and so that, you know, we were thinking, boy, it's going to be hard for people who have resected disease to continue it. It was much better with osimertinib, you know, so not that there's no issues, but it's pretty manageable. I've had two patients the past year that I reduced to 40 milligrams, um, uh, or one to 60, one to 40, but otherwise just about everybody can tolerate it. You know, there's, just the minor issues, a little bit of diarrhea, a little bit of skin and fingernail issues. But overall, people are, are able to tolerate it. Uh, uh, you know, now we haven't, I haven't had a lot of people get to three years yet. So we'll see what happens when it's time to discontinue it. But I suspect there'll be a lot of people who are not enthusiastic about stopping the drug. So uh, I, I also asked uh, whether people were surprised when they saw the survival benefit. I mean, I heard people say they didn't think there was going to be a survival benefit, and it was like 0.5. But Jamie, you weren't surprised at all. You're kind of expecting number. You know, it wasn't people weren't as uh, surprised as I thought they might be uh, about that finding. Uh, one more question, just a practical question, uh, uh, Jamie. Uh, do you hold osimertinib on patients on, for example, adjuvant osimertinib? before surgical procedures. A little, little heterogeneity here, but in general, I think people are saying no. John says he actually does it. What's your thinking on that, John? Yeah, you know, this is one where we don't have a lot of data, and mechanistically, I don't expect that it should cause any problems. Um, you know, this is unlike the VEGF inhibitors, for example, where we know VEGF inhibitors impair wound healing. Um, here, uh, we don't expect it should cause any problems. The reason I hold it, first of all, surgeons are often very nervous having it on. Secondly, sometimes people have a, uh, some diarrhea that can be a problem in the postoperative setting. 
So it's really, I, I don't have a lot of data, but just to avoid that issue of, you know, getting up and out of bed and, you know, recovering quickly after surgery, I just hold it for a few days and then, you know, start it on day four usually. So one final question, then we're going to get to immunotherapy, but I have to ask about FLAR2 that was just presented in Singapore, combining chemotherapy and osimertinib and metastatic disease. This is my one metastatic, but I, I just had to ask, like, what do you think it means? It was a positive study. Uh, Jamie, what are your thoughts about uh, using uh, chemo plus osimertinib as first-line therapy of metastatic disease? You bring up the issue of brain mets. I mean, first and foremost, we need to wait for the survival data because you, you have to be skeptical about whether there will be any impact or if sequential therapy would be good enough. I think, however, I was most um, impressed by the the hazard ratio for the subset of patients with brain metastases. Um, clearly, we can see brain metastases resolve with osimertinib alone, but I think perhaps for someone with symptomatic brain metastases, the combination might have merit. All right. Well, let's talk about immunotherapy. And uh, d uh, I see in the chat room, Dr. Rudolph has a case. So let's start out with that. So John, uh, tell me what you think about this. Here's Dr. Rudolph. I saw in follow-up today, after lung surgery, a 73-year-old man with squamous cell carcinoma, clinical stage two, treated with neoadjuvant carbotaxol nevo times three cycles, checkmate regimen, as residual 1.5 centimeter tumor, with some noted treatment effect and multi-level positive nodes, including two Hyler, two AP windows, so now T1 and PTN2. Uh, her question is, should I give more Nevo and for how long? Uh, John, any thoughts about this case? Yeah, well, so we'll have something of an answer in the near future. There's a study called 77T that's testing this exact regimen. Uh, it's sort of like checkmate 816 chemo nevo and then with nevo afterwards. Um, you know, and my guess is it would be beneficial. We don't have the data in hand yet. I think what I would um, consider, first of all, is whether radiation might be merited if you've had all those positive mediastinal lymph nodes. Um, and then even though we don't have data, you know, given that amount of residual disease, I suspect, you know, additional immunotherapy would help in this setting. You know, if you look at the... Um, the non-PET-CR group from the Keynote 671 study, um, you know, chemo versus uh, the, um, uh, the, the Pembro arm, the uh, Pembro chemo, you know, even for the non-PET-CR, it did look like there was a, a significant benefit of continuing the immunotherapy for that year afterwards. Uh, it's not a perfect comparison. So, uh, you know, I, I suspect it would be helpful and I would consider radiation there as well. So, Jamie, any thoughts about this case? And also your comments on uh, pathology after neoadjuvant therapy. You know, you've shown that you have like this thing called major pathologic response where there's still stuff there. My, my simple understanding is you still see tumor there, but I don't know whether it's necrotic or, you know, dead, et cetera. Uh, any comments about this case? Would you, any, would you give further therapy? And any comments about... Uh, pathology after neoadjuvant treatment? Yeah, so um, I'll start with the case. I, I totally agree with John. I, if this patient progressed through neoadjuvant chemo nevo, uh, meaning those nodes were radiographically and pathologically new, then I think I'd be less enthusiastic about immu more immunotherapy and really think about changing gears and considering radiotherapy despite the data. Um, the studies that show no lack of benefit for port were underpowered with an unrealistic statistical design. Um, in terms of the pathologic endpoints, I'll say PATH-CR is, is very reassuring and we'd love to see it. I would even say major pathologic response. It was really a, a modified endpoint just because we weren't seeing PATH-CR at a clinically meaningful, meaningful frequency, which we are now with combination therapy. But what to do with, with the rest, patients who don't have total tumor kill, it's really hard to say. I think I'm far more worried about patients that have all of their disease still viable or most of their disease still viable at the time of resection, really no treatment effect because they're very likely to recur and quickly. So let's talk a little bit about first some of the trials uh, that we're talking about here. First, the uh, adjuvin trials uh, using uh, checkpoint inhibitors. And uh, John, actually, uh, 
Nabin in the chat room has a case that relates to the next slide I was about to show, amazingly enough. So 70-year-old man, 4.3 centimeter right upper lobe squamous cell, unable to get surgery due to bad emphysema, coronary stents recently placed. The plan is for radiation therapy, doesn't say what type. Any role of neoadjuvant chemo IO or adjuvant chemo and uh, IO after radiation. And I hadn't seen uh, this study, but this is super cool. I think relevant, John. Yeah, no, that's right. So this was a randomized phase two study we, we conducted. We just reported the results of this. And it was for situations just like this, medically inoperable. Um, you know, our focus was on node negative uh, uh, patients. Um, but, you know, we, we've seen now in a couple of different settings, when you give SBRT, stereotactic body radiotherapy to a tumor, and give immunotherapy afterwards, it seems to be a really large benefit. And I think that benefit's going to be much larger than if you're radiating the mediastinum, where you're killing all these T cells uh, that you're trying to stimulate. There have been a number of studies that with high dose radiation to the mediastinum where outcomes have been disappointing. So what we did here is we randomized patients in that situation uh, to SBRT with or without Nevo. And it was only four doses of Nevo. It was once every uh, once a month for four doses. And the benefit was really substantial here. You see the hazard ratio uh, about 0.4. You know, another interesting thing is it, it reduced uh, distant mets as well as local recurrence, but it also reduced new primaries from occurring. Uh, you know, even though it wasn't powered for that, that was an exploratory endpoint. Now, um, this wasn't run as a registration study. There's a couple of registration studies that have similar designs that I'll read out over the next few years, but it really does raise the question, after you get SBRT, would patients benefit from a course of uh, immunotherapy afterwards? Jamie, any thoughts about this, both from a practical and a theoretical uh, perspective? I guess people have always wondered, was uh, like some kind of radiation or abscopal effect part of the benefit that was seen in the Pacific trial? I know I remember talking to uh, a, a number of people about that and really gave people a lot of optimism about adjuvant therapy. Any thoughts, Jamie? Well, we have to keep in mind that our medically inoperable patient population is often a smoking-based patient population. These are folks with bad lungs from COPD. So otherwise, um, their tumors are more likely genomically predisposed to benefit from immunotherapy in combination with radiotherapy. So while these results are super exciting, we're doing a, a similar study. And, and like always, MD Anderson beat us to the publication. I imagine we'll see the same trend. Um, I think what we really need to consider moving forward when these drugs are available from the, the larger cooperative group studies is, is risk adaption and really only being sure we're giving these immunotherapies with risk to patients who have high enough risk tumors that they're likely to relapse and really minimizing relapse in a risk appropriate scenario. So I'm going to go through a couple of the newer studies that have just come out of you know, this year to add on to the ones we had previously. One, uh, John, you actually presented at the uh, AACR, the AGN study. Can you talk a little bit about what you saw there and how it compares to uh, the other data that we have in this setting? Yeah. Yeah, so we have two big perioperative studies that have read out. They're both about the same size, about 800 patients. And in, in both of them, we've got neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy uh, and then adjuvant uh, as well, so putting both uh, both together. Uh, so the Aegean w was um, notable because patients with EGFR and ALK were excluded. Now, uh, when we started, they were included, but then Adora read out, and we said, well, we can't keep treating them with immunotherapy. So then we, you know, revised the, uh, the design. Um, but the endpoints are, are EFS and, uh, and pathologic response. And at the first interim analysis, it hit its endpoint uh, of improving uh, uh, EFS here. Uh, so you see the hazard ratio 0.68. Now, it's worth pointing out that over a quarter of patients are still getting immunotherapy uh, in the DERVA arm, you know, because it read out so early because it hit its endpoint, you know, there's still more benefit that will be had in this. Um, uh, but, but you know, this is similar to, to 617. 
but we expect that the, the benefit here will continue to be realized and, and the hazard ratio will continue to drop as we have more time and patients complete their immunotherapy there uh, as well. So that's uh, the first uh, uh, perioperative study that's, that's positive. Keynote 671 has a similar design, although EGFR and ALK were not excluded here. Um, and again, a similar benefit. This is a more mature study. And so you, you see, I think that the, uh, the, the results are, are um, uh, a little bit more mature and the hazard ratio is a little bit better here, but a very substantial benefit uh, once again uh, to treatment. You see here the hazard ratio 0.58. Uh, for uh, the Pembro arm versus the placebo arm, uh, and a really substantial benefit at two years. Um, you, you know, you see there over 20% uh, reduction in the likelihood of, of recurring. So I think two really solid results that tell us the perioperative approach uh, certainly looks effective. Now, you know, uh, how does that compare to just the adjuvant or neoadjuvant? Well, you know, we don't have the head-to-head -head comparison. Everybody would love the head-to-head -head comparison, but you know, my sense, given that we expect the hazard ratios for both of these studies to improve over time, uh, because the the stage two readouts are very early for for both studies. Um, you know, I, to, to me, this feels like the type regimen we should build on, um, and I think the six seven one we expect is going to get approved this year. With their Purdue date is uh, October, I believe. So I think we're going to have the keynote six seven one as the first perioperative regimen. Uh, that's FDA approved. Jamie, any thoughts about these uh, two studies and how they fit in with the data we already have? And I want to start going through some of the survey questions are related to that. And this is kind of interesting because in terms of the adjuvant situation, we saw a little disparity in terms of findings for PD-1 negative PEMBRA versus a TEZO. Uh, so first, before we get into that adjuvant, any thoughts about the two new uh, neoadjuvant studies, Jamie? Nothing much to add. I think the real question is, is do these patients who don't have uh, path CR or any treatment effect benefit from that adjuvant component? And the early data looks fairly impressive in the non-path CR population for, for pembrolizumab in 671, but we'll really have to look at, at all of the related data moving forward to decide who needs additional therapy and for how long. You know, John, in uh, breast cancer, they have the Catherine study where they gave neoadjuvant therapy to patients with HER2 positive disease. And then if they didn't have a path CR, they gave a different therapy, an antibody drug conjugate, TDM1, had another 50% drop by doing that. Any thoughts about a strategy like that in lung cancer, maybe going, uh, you know, anti-CTLA-4 add-on or some other strategy if patients have residual disease? Yeah, I think that that's exactly the direction we need to move in. I think if you take the group that has a path CR and gets a year of immunotherapy afterwards, their outcomes are outstanding. You know, uh, their likelihood of, of uh, being uh, disease-free at five years is almost 90%. But the group that doesn't have a path complete response, uh, they're really where the recurrences are happening uh, and the likelihood is quite high. So I think that's exactly what we need to do is figure out how to intensify that group. Now, when we did PD-1 and CTLA-4, it looked better. So that's one approach. But, you know, we've got all these new type of drugs coming along like the ADCs. Maybe it'll be, uh, you know, an ADC to intensify it or maybe, you know, uh, you could think of a, a number of different approaches. So I, I think that's where the excitement is going to be for the next five years is figuring out how to intensify the non-PET CR group. Yeah, in breast cancer, they're already doing comparative trials, you know, yep. T TDM1 versus adding stuff to it, a different thing, et cetera. So I guess that's the direction. Let's get back to this question of the adjuvant situation, uh, Jamie. Again, we have the kind of weird situation that we saw uh, a, a difference in terms of uh, the benefit and based on PD-1 level. Uh, any thoughts? Can you maybe talk a little bit about uh, this question? Uh, do you have a preferred uh, uh, agent? Everybody either picks one, but John will ask him to talk about why he has his approach. What you're thinking about this, Jamie? I mean, we, we largely think of all of these drugs as being very, very comparable. Um, I have not fully bought on to um, recommending 
adjuvant immunotherapy for patients who have resected tumors without PDL1 expression. So for, for simplicity, I would choose atezolizumab just because the benefit was consistent. Um, the pembrolizumab data is just not what we expected to see. There's, it, it's a little dirty for lack of a better description, um, probably a statistical anomaly. But for ease and because it was first there, I've been most comfortable using atezolizumab. It doesn't mean I wouldn't use pembrolizumab in the right patient. So uh, I'll also ask, and John, maybe you can talk a little bit more about your thinking in terms of choice based on uh, PD-1 level. Uh, we said, you know, high versus negative. Uh, can you comment on your thoughts about that and how you approach it clinically? Yeah, well, I, I agree with Jamie's comment that I, I don't think there's really major differences between them. I'm comfortable using anyone. Um, I think the um, Empower 10 study with the tezolizumab was well designed and uh, you know, it really showed what we expected, more benefit for the higher PDL1, essentially no benefit for the PDL1 negative. So I, I have confidence in, in that result, and I think overall those results looked a little bit stronger. Pembrolizumab had this weird result where they had very little benefit in the high PDL1, but did have benefit in the PDL1 negative. Um, you know, so I, I'll use it there for the PDL1 negative. It's theoretically on label, but I think the benefit is pretty small, and I would discuss it with patients. So I would say I'm, I'm lukewarm about it for PDL1 negatives, uh, but pretty strongly uh, in favor of it for PDL1 positives. All right, I'm just going to throw in a case from the chat room here. It's not exactly in, the, in this vein, but it looks like a really cool case, Jamie, from Hassan, 57-year-old man who's a smoker. I, here's the only details we have is he has one brain met resected in the frontal lobe, a two-centimeter lung mass, and an adrenal met by PET scan, adenocarcinoma, PD-1 is zero. How would you manage this oligomet situation, Jamie? Oy. Um, this is really Oy. A, <laughs> a place where you have a lot of options. Technically, this patient is stage four disease. Um, the pd one negative makes me a little nervous that there's going to be a, a drastic response to chemoimmunotherapy. I mean, first and foremost, we need next generation sequencing to, to understand the full biomarker profile, but assuming this is a driver negative case, um, the patient's extremely appropriate for chemoimmunotherapy, followed by consideration of local modality therapies to the lung and adrenal. Um, for cases like this that are pdl one negative, it's one of the few places where I would uh, consider the Checkmate 9LA regimen with ipinevo and chemo, uh, particularly if, if the patient had a high tumor mutation burden. Um, however, a lot depends on the patient's preferences and, and considerations of other tumor features such as TTF1 expression um, and genomics. So, uh, John, any thoughts? And generally, what are you doing with PD-1-0? Do you use you know, Ipinevo, for example, or anti cg yeah. 4 PD-1? Yeah, I, I, think, um, I think I would probably pick the 9-LA regimen or the Poseidon regimen here. Uh, the 9-LA data is reported... Uh, particularly good data for CNS mets. And there is a you know, growing body, especially for melanoma, of data with ipinevo for brain mets. Um, and so pdl one negative like this, I think I would probably do the 9-LA regimen or, or, or Poseidon and then evaluate after um, three months of therapy for consolidation, for radiating and or resecting what's residual uh, in this situation. All right, let's go back to another case. This patient has a really cool imaging finding I'm curious about. A 70-year-old man, a patient of uh, Jamie's, a former so smoker, who presents with cough. What happened there, Jamie? The patient underwent a bronchoscopic biopsy. Um, the primary tumor was biopsied, showing a non-small cell lung cancer, P40 positive, favoring squamous cell carcinoma, with a pdl one expression of 60%. Um, certainly an N1 disease, someone who could go directly to the OR, but there's lots of reasons to consider induction therapy, including for a hyalur disease, recrushion from the hilum may enable a lesser resection, probably most notable for right-sided tumors where a bilobectomy uh, could be potentially performed instead of a, a pneumonectomy or even a single lobe. It allows time for prehabilitation. And for me, as the prescri as the treating oncologist, I'd like to see their drugs work. It's really uh, tough to give adjuvant therapy and not know if it's helping. And, and those curves there are just from the neoadjuvant chemo meta-analysis showing it's a comparable hazard ratio to chemo adjuvantly. 
Um, so this patient received uh, induction carboplatin, paclitaxel, and nivolumab. I have not been comfortable waiting three full cycles um, per the 816 regimen to, to re-image. So the patient had a CT scan showing a nice partial response after two cycles and a PET scan showing a scintigraphic near CR. However, you can see the thyroid gland lighting up and labs at the time of post-induction evaluation showed no adrenal insufficiency, but severe hypothyroidism that had to be corrected before anesthesia would be comfortable taking him to the operating room. So really a nice radiographic response. I checked again right before we logged on. His path still isn't back. He went to the OR last week, um, but the, the report's not signed out yet. Uh, it really did take a good three-week delay, however, to get um, him to have some detectable free thyroid hormone on, on repletion before um, it was safe to take him to the operating room. John, just curious, you know, uh, the image there where you see on the pet the thyroid light up is super cool. I mean, have you seen that before? You, mean, you hear so much about thyroid issues with IOs. I don't know whether other people have seen that. I mean, it's just kind of an interesting finding. Yeah, I mean, I've seen it uh, light up sort of diffusely and, and be enlarged, uh, you know, like when you have a goiter. But that is particularly FDG avid. That's uh, that's a very strong uh, finding. And, uh, you know, kudos to the, the team there for paying attention before taking the patient to surgery. Uh, sometimes I think we can be a little flippant about uh, hypothyroidism in these patients. Um, but uh, uh, I guess it, it is important to keep in mind around surgery. It's It's important to... Uh, have managed it. So, when again to some of the uh, uh, issues uh, from that came up in the survey, but Jamie, it also brings up the question of complications from neoadjuvant therapy, either in, uh, being an issue at surgery or delaying surgery, as happened here in this case. We had another patient who had very severe dermatologic issues; they had to hold off going to surgery, not making the surgeons too happy. But globally, what do we see in terms of uh, delays in surgery and complications of surgery with neoadjuvant chemo IO compared to chemo, Jamie. I mean, the, the the data don't show much in terms of uh, of worsening of those delays. Really, the one thing we have to keep in mind is most patients who have notable toxicity from these drugs they they respond. So a little bit of a delay to make sure they can safely go to the OR in my eyes isn't a big clinical dilemma. Um, certainly, if you look at failure to get to the OR, that's more common in the chemo arm from all of these studies. So better response from combination therapy, irrespective of toxicity, the more likely these patients are to go to the OR and have a complete resection. So John, I'd like you to react to some of the answers we got on this survey about uh, adjuvant, neoadjuvant therapy related to autoimmune complications, again, in the adjuvant situation as opposed to the metastatic situation, a kind of a little bit different uh, thinking when you have some patients potentially who might be cured. So we said, first of all, what's the likelihood that somebody will get through a year of adjuvant immunotherapy? And you can see that there's a little variation in what people think or what they've experienced, uh, but not inconsequential number who don't make it for a year. And these kinds of things, I think, maybe are useful to docs in practice so they can sort of uh, compare notes. In terms of uh, how many people actually get through. Again, you can see the estimate there. We asked uh, what people typically see, and of course you see, again, a lot of thyroid dysfunction in this short-term uh, uh, setting. Uh, this is another question I'm curious about. We asked this in a lot of different solid tumor programs, John, if there's a correlation between autoimmune toxicity and benefit. When you see an autoimmune complication, do you think to yourself, oh, maybe we're going to get uh, more f efficacy. I know in the past there was a lot of questions about this, and I was curious that at least at this point, people seem to believe there is a correlation. Any thoughts, John, about uh, these uh, uh, findings from the survey? Yeah, you know, I, I, I well, I agree with what everybody else answered here. You know, the, the the data for this that's clearest, I think, is in the metastatic setting, and there have been you know retrospective analyses, for example, from the nine LA study of comparing outcomes in people who had immune-related toxicity and those who didn't. Uh, and those with immune-related toxicities, even if they had to stop the drug, had a little bit better outcomes uh, than those who didn't. Um, you know, it's interesting. It, it reminds me, going back to the days with small cell, uh, the patients who had a paraneoplastic syndrome, 
uh, you know, which is usually immune mediated, often had better outcomes as well. So I think these are just harbingers that uh, the immune system is is more active. So uh, one final question, and I'm just going to show you, you check it out. We have a, a lot of data in the chat room. We asked people about clinical situations where they're sort of on the fence about giving adjuvant immunotherapy because of prior autoimmune disease. Jamie had a case of a patient, for example, with controlled Crohn's disease who uh, she treated but without an IO. But um, I wanted to just uh, finish out. With, we, uh, Jamie, we have a little thing, a, we, a little poll we do every time we do a webinar about how long it's going to take somebody in the chat room to ask cell-free DNA. And this is the latest we've ever got one, 5.59 p.m., any CTNA data to guide adjuvant there. I knew it was coming. Usually it's like 15, 20 minutes in. But uh, what about cell-free DNA in this situation, Jamie? Of course, we're hearing it all in many different solid tumors. And you heard about it in John's case already. Right. Unlike the physician's wife in Texas, I haven't <laughs> been convinced to, to order it routinely in in clinical practice. This is definitely the wave of the future. We're just not there yet. And I think the cost and confusion today outweigh any clinical insight provided by CTDNA assays off study. But is this going to change the world? Yeah. Um, we just need good studies to teach us exactly where and how to employ the data. And my hope is that it's utilized for de-escalation studies. So, uh, Jamie and John, thank you so much uh, for working with us today. Audience, thank you for attending. Uh, come on back uh, next Tuesday. We'll hear what Dr. Iyer and uh, Brad Call have to say about mantle cell. John has spent a couple hours with your colleague, uh, Dr. Michael Wong. I can't wait to hear what these people think about what he said about first-line therapy of mantle cell. Hint, hint, mm -hmm. BTK rituximab to be continued, yeah. but... Check it out. We'll see what the faculty thinks about that idea. Be safe, stay well, and have a great night. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, John. Okay. Have a good one. All right. Thank Thanks, Neil.